Good afternoon, and welcome back to another installment in the Floyd Zadkovich uh, presentation series. And I'm very happy that you're back with us again today, and I hope that uh, everyone joining us will find this discussion to be informative and helpful. Uh, certainly welcome any questions, feedback, etc. Um, feel free, free to reach out to me or any of my colleagues. Floyd Zadkovich, International Commercial Lawyers. As those of you who have been with us for the past couple days and following some of our uh, prior installments know, FZ during this period of time, uh, when there appears to be a coming, if not already here, uh, global financial and economic crisis, quite a serious one, we have been focusing on discussions and writings which concern uh, the legal tools legal devices, the legal procedures, which could be of assistance to market participants as they encounter counterparties who look like they may or who actually do a default on contracts of any nature. Um, so we're covering a number of topics and I hope that each of these is helpful. I hope that each of these opens the mind and refreshes the mind uh, about considerations that should be at the forefront as we move into this very um, uncertain period of time economically and financially. So the particular topic which I am going to discuss uh, today is the United States approach to bankruptcy. And obviously that's a massive topic. Uh, I will not be going in depth into it today, but what I hoped to deliver would be a refresher on some of the key terms, concepts, phrases, and functions of United States bankruptcy. Um, so to begin, United States bankruptcy law is, is covered by Title 11 of the United States Code. And it provides amongst other things for liquidation that's chapter seven of 11 U.S. Code. It provides for reorganization, which is under chapter 11. And as many of you abroad uh, may remember from prior years when, when it was commonly employed, particularly in the maritime sector, uh, there's also chapter 15, which covers U.S. recognition of foreign insolvency proceedings. What I think would be helpful is to touch briefly on some of the basic concepts, the key concepts, which come up time and time over again in connection with any bankruptcy. Um, one, which is at the very beginning, and the beginning is always a good spot to start, is who qualifies to be a debtor. Obviously, a debtor needs to be in insolvency or near insolvency. Um, I think that's probably universal around the world. Uh, but Section 109 of 11 U.S. Code provides, and I, I won't quote here, but just paraphrasing, provides that anyone who is resident or domiciled within the United States or who has business operations in the United States or who has property in the United States is eligible to be a debtor under 11 U.S. Code. I think that's a very important uh, provision to keep in mind. It opens up the possibility for any number of businesses around the globe to look uh, to the United States for potential bankruptcy type protections. Um, of course, even if they are not able to come directly in and pursue their own reorganization in a US court, there is also the possibility of a chapter 15 bankruptcy recognizing foreign insolvency proceeding, and I'll get to that more later. But the takeaway there, uh, 109A describes who is eligible, and it includes anyone who has business operations or property in the United States. Section 362 is also a provision of the Bankruptcy Code, which uh, is, is central to it. It's, it's absolutely central. 362 covers the automatic stay. And I, I would imagine that most uh, listeners out there are familiar, at least with the phrase, 
automatic stay, but maybe not fully up to speed on what it means. Um, the gist of it is that upon the filing of a petition for bankruptcy in the United States, the automatic stay comes into effect immediately and it prohibits the commencement or the continuation of any actions against the debtor or the debtor's property. Um, the only type of bankruptcy proceeding in the U.S. that does not automatically give rise to the so-called automatic stay is actually Chapter 15 bankruptcy, and I'll touch on that some more at the very end here, um, but generally when a Chapter 15 is filed, um, which is a petition for recognition of a foreign proceeding rather than a petition for bankruptcy relief in the U.S., um, when that petition for recognition is filed, one generally couples it with a request for a motion for a gap period injunction to cover the period of time up until the court decides whether or not to grant recognition and so that there is a continuous uh, period extension of protection to the debtors of property so long as the gap period injunction is granted. I've dealt with cases where it hasn't been granted um, when I was acting for creditors, protecting creditor rights, and that's always a good thing, but I, I will say it's very difficult um, to achieve that, and the expectation should be that a gap period injunction uh, will generally be granted. But again, um, if one pushes hard, you can sometimes avoid that. So uh, never foreclose any possibilities is something I say. And, yeah. Two other sections which I think should be kept in mind uh, as we move into possible creditor um, situations where creditors face counterparties who are going into default and may seek bankruptcy protection. Um, those two sections concern preference transactions and fraudulent transfers. Uh, specifically, that those two I think should be read hand in hand or at least kept in mind uh, side by side. Uh, 547 of 11 U.S. Code concerns preferences. 548 concerns fraudulent transfers. Um, even their enumeration indicates how closely tied they are to one another. Um, a preference transaction concerns a situation where a creditor is paid uh, a sum on account of an antecedent debt prior to the filing of the bankruptcy pr uh, petition. And that transfer to the creditor puts the creditor in a better position than it would be if the bankruptcy had just run its course and that creditor received a distribution or whatever it might receive at the end of the day. So preferences uh, deal with situations where a creditor is paid and receives a better position than it would otherwise have. Um, there's a three month look back period for most creditors. If the creditor is an insider of the debtor as well, then it's a one year look back period. Fraudulent transfers um, are key, and we're going to have a, a separate video uh, dedicated to that topic as well because it is such a broad topic and it's important. Um, fraudulent transfer law exists both under the general laws of most U.S. states. In fact, I think all 50 states have adopted some version of either the Uniform Fraudulent Conveyances Act or the Uniform Fraudulent Transfer Act. And there's a new version that's out there now, the Voidable uh, Transactions Act. But that state law is also incorporated basically into federal bankruptcy law, or it goes hand in hand. That's under Section 548, and what 548 does, much like 547, which deals with preferences, it allows the trustee in bankruptcy to um, make an argument that a court should avoid a transaction which was either a preference or a fraudulent transfer. Um, the gist of a fraudulent transfer is not so much that it put a creditor in a better position, but that the function of the transfer was to um, hinder, delay, or frustrate legitimate creditors. And so it's much more focused on the situation where there's insiders, um, transfers going to an insider to circumvent the liquidation process or circumvent the reorganization process and really to better an insider um, as opposed to just a creditor being put in a better position than they ordinarily would be if things went according to plan. 
With those considerations in mind, um, I, I will very briefly touch on Chapter 15 bankruptcy. And I think that that's important to touch on because when we last saw a global financial crisis um, in, in the 2008 range and then running on from years, uh, several years after that, there was a slew of cross-border insolvencies, um, particularly affecting the, the maritime industry and the commodities trading industry. And that could happen again, certainly. Um, so chapter 15 is the US version of the UNCITRAL model law on cross-border insolvency. It provides a mechanism for the United States bankruptcy courts to provide, extend recognition to foreign insolvency type proceedings. As I mentioned earlier, the filing of a mere petition to obtain that recognition will not give rise to the automatic stay. Instead, when filing that petition, one needs to couple it with a motion seeking, I guess, what's called commonly a gap period injunction. And that gap period refers to the period of weeks or maybe a month or so. It's not a set period of time um, between the initial filing and when a court will make a decision. Uh, because it is only at the point that a court decides whether or not to grant recognition that a statutory stay can come into effect. And I say that a statutory stay can come into effect because the statutory stay is only mandatory if the underlying foreign bankruptcy for which recognition is being sought is pending in a country where the foreign debtor has its COMI, C-O-M-I, or center of main interests. Um, center of main interest is probably best understood as the country in which a given corporation is registered. So if a foreign debtor has its, main, uh, has its foreign proceeding for insolvency pending in the country where it also has its COMI, then recognition in the U.S. will yield a stay of creditor actions. Um, the territorial scope of that stay is not as broad as it would be under Section 362 ordinarily, um, because Section 362, the automatic stay from the U.S. perspective for plenary bankruptcy proceedings has global reach. Under Chapter 15, uh, the reach of a stay is limited to the territorial jurisdiction of the United States. Um, lastly, on, on that point, if a foreign insolvency proceeding is pending in a country where the a foreign debtor does not have its uh, COMI, then recognition in the U.S. would only be as a foreign non-main proceeding and whether or not to extend a stay is at the discretion of the court, um, though I would say that ordinarily the stay is granted. A couple of takeaways regarding uh, foreign insolvencies in Chapter 15. Um, there is a belief out there that Chapter 15 is a rubber stamp exercise. Judges oftentimes try to uh, correct that view they note routinely in decisions concerning Chapter 15 that it should not be a rubber stamp exercise. And more and more, this is a statute that's barely been around for 16, 15 or 16 years, and it's still developing. There was a predecessor uh, to it, but it was not mandatory. It had many, many distinctions. Um, chapter 15's only been around for 15 or 16 years. It's still being developed. And I would encourage creditors not to just roll over and accept recognition, question what's going on, question whether or not the so-called Comey is truly the Comey, look into it more, investigate and push. Even if it becomes inevitable that there is going to be recognition and protections extended in the United States, it's important to stay on top of that bankruptcy proceeding. I've been involved in situations, it may have been the only situation um, but where persistence led to a court terminating recognition of a foreign bankruptcy because it became apparent that it was not truly, um, amongst other things, it didn't look like a collective proceeding. And being a collective proceeding uh, is 
critical to the legitimacy of a foreign bankruptcy. Um, collective in that sense means that all creditors or all creditors within a given class are going to be treated equally. And that is, that is key, it's critical. And if one can show that the reality or the potential for disparate treatment of creditors within the same class exists, or that a proceeding is not even truly collective in any sense, that is more akin to uh, a receivership where there's a single creditor who's going to get everything, there's a fight to be had. And don't give up on that fight. Thank you very much for joining me today. Look forward to speaking more uh, as we go, go through the rest of this series. Have a good evening.